I would like to welcome you to NextGen Healthcare's webinar, Value-Based Payment, Meet Metrics and Decrease Utilization with Population Health Management. Today, we have a great lineup of speakers. First, Dr. Ronki Komolaki will provide an overview of the transformation of healthcare and the move toward value-based payment. Then, Dr. Amy Munoz and Nicole Huggett will take us through the process of how Kodak Health Recovery and Wellness in Arizona has improved patient outcomes by measuring and improving quality metrics. If you have any questions, please submit them electronically through the WebEx window in the bottom right hand of your screen. We will have time dedicated at the end of the presentation to address your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you and available on nextgen.com in the next few business days. And now, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Ronsky Komalafi. Thank you, Bridget. Welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Komalafi. I'm excited to present with Dr. Amy and Nicole Huggett. Today, we'll be talking in more detail about value-based payments and the different strategies and roadmaps that Kodak took to excel in the value-based payment programs. As we all know, healthcare is transforming at a, at a very accelerated rate, and the rate through which healthcare is transforming is based on patient engagement, value-based care, and how to better use data to provide better care and improve care outcomes. As we look at this slide, as we look at the next slide, we can see continuous improvement in value-based contracts across the country. 58% of specialty provider organizations have some form of value-based contract arrangement as of 2020. We have about 63% behavioral health providers across the country participating in value-based arrangements. About 49% ch children's services have some form of value-based arrangement, and about 48% of IDD providers participate in some form of value-based arrangement. As we look at the next slide, we can see the different types of value-based arrangements that these providers are participating in. The most common and highest is the pay-for-performance and then the fee-for-service, which everybody um, knows about the progression to value-based payments. But the pay-for-performance is the highest value-based model that providers are engaged in as of 2020, followed by case rate or bundled rate. As Kodak talks more about the transition through value-based payments and how they've been able to improve care and utilization for their crisis patients, we'll see how their value-based contracts, the population health management programs, has helped them save money and, and increase positive health care outcomes for their patients. As we look at this slide, we can see the value-based payment arrangement across the country. I won't go into detail, into detail about this different types of value-based payment arrangements. We all know what they are, but I'll be focusing more on the population health and the partial capitation aspect of value-based payments. This pyramid, this pyramid shows us that about 5% of the healthcare population spend over 50% of healthcare resources and, and income in, 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 in their care delivery system. This population, which are usually, which are known as the high needs, high cost population, typically require extra care to better manage their care and to help reduce utilization and the cost of care. As Kodak goes more in detail about their crisis management and their population health management, they'll talk in detail about how they've been able to decrease utilization of their um, behavioral health patients. One of my favorite discussions when we talk about value-based payments are the different analytical tools that you can use to better enhance your program. There are three different types of tools. We have the descriptive analytic tool, the predictive analytic tool, and the prescriptive analytic tool. The best form of tool, um, population health system you can have is one that can provide you all of these three analytic tools. The descriptive analytic tool tells you where your, where your um, organization is in terms of population health. It tells you about the metrics, how well you're doing with the metrics, but it doesn't help predict the future of the patient or how likely the patient is to engage in care or help decrease the cost of care. 
However, the predictive analytic tools combine both the descriptive and the predictive characteristics of data mining and management. It looks at previous data and helps use that data to predict future, future characteristics and possible likely outcomes when, when a patient is being, um, when the population is being managed using a standard form of care. It also helps to identify the gaps in care. The predictive analytic tool combines all forms of analytic tools because it focuses on how to provide standard of care to address those gaps and how to use case management coordination of care to look at the history, the current gaps in care, and to use the standard of care across the clinical spectrum to ensure the patient's population has been managed for positive healthcare outcomes. So as, as, as an organization continues to advance in value-based payments, there are several key factors and outcomes that need to be identified. Defining the population, if you have a population of 10,000, it's best to identify the high needs, high cost population, or the population that needs population health management the most, identify the gaps in care, use an analytical tool to risk stress by this, this uh, population, and then provide patient engagement, case management, and help to help manage their care and implement interventions. And then use fortuitous measures, quality measures, or any type of outcome measures used by organization or required by a value-based contract to help measure the progression of the population health management program. As I pass this over to Kodak, Dr. Amy will be telling us more about how Kodak has been able to use their um, analytical tools and their case management and in internal processes to better engage their crisis patients and improve care outcomes for them. Over to you, Dr. Amy. Thank you, Dr. Kamalathi. All right, so I'm going to start with a little bit of my background. I work at Kodak Health Recovery and Wellness. Uh, my name is Dr. Amy Munoz. Um, my particular background is in utilization management. So my department uh, works specifically interfacing with hospitals. Um, I also oversee a department uh, that oversees residential services. Uh, we serve our particular agency, which I'll go into more depth a little bit later, is a an integrated healthcare provider who provides services to approximately uh, 10,000 duly diagnosed individuals, uh, ranging from general mental health, um, individuals that are receiving PCP only services, individuals that have a diagnosis of a serious mental illness, um, or somebody that has a substance use disorder. So that's my background. Uh, and that's where value based purchases, purchase contracts, and the interest there comes into play. Now we, like many of you, have been looking at hospitalization, and that is one of the most high cost uh, services or high cost um, services that, that our members engage in. Um, we're looking at readmissions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the hypothesis. I'm gonna talk about learning objectives that we hope to um, provide to you during this uh, particular webinar. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, history and review of our project and go into the different procedures and then the evolution of those procedures. And then I know, know Nicole will talk a little bit more about the data. So our hypothesis as we start off was that providing a quick engagement post crisis and our definition of crisis for this webinar is anybody that has been hospitalized in a level one setting. In Arizona, we call it level one. So it's anybody that's been in detox or hospitalized psychiatrically or even having a medical crisis. And that that direct engagement and quick engagement will reduce uh, readmission rates. The first learning objective that we had is that by the end of the session, we hope that we'll be able to establish new protocols within your own organization to bridge gaps in care uh, from inpatient to outpatient settings. We're also hoping that you'll be able to assess cost savings related to uh, unnecessary crisis utilization. And for the purposes of this presentation, we find unnecessary utilization as um, basically any visit for a condition 
uh, for which delay of several hours would not increase the likelihood of, of an adverse outcome. So in essence, anything, any service that can be met in a less restrictive level of care rather than an emergency department or a hospital. We also hope that um, you employ new treatment approaches and interventions that improve the seven to 30 day HEDIS measure fidelity. Now, I'm hoping you're all familiar with HEDIS measures, but for those of you that aren't, it's basically the healthcare effectiveness data and information set tool that we are all um, held to those particular standards. And they measure, they measure performance on important dimensions of care, uh, consisting of 94 measures across seven different dimensions. When we first looked at the literature review on this, we wanted to see what other folks had learned prior to that. So what, what was the prescription or what was the, the time period that was suggested or the best practice to link somebody from an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting? Um, as we know, recent statistics, and when I say recent, within the last five years, so they're pretty much obsolete, um, estimate that unnecessary rehospitalizations are about 74 $17.4 billion, um, and that continuity of care uh, or a smooth transition can make all the difference from somebody that's coming from a higher level of care to an out to a lower level of care. So we were looking at what did people do before us, and we found some inconsistencies in the literature. So I could not find um, a, a comparable uh, integrated healthcare setting that provided services to the wide uh, array of individuals that we serve. I found a lot of literature on chronic health care conditions and elderly populations and these very um, siloed populations. But I could not find like anything that prescribed a period of time that, that we would adhere to to be able to provide services to uh, better our outcomes. Uh, many of the research studies varied in demographics, and again, that uh, the only consistent thread that I found in the literature review that was that the quicker that you provide services, the better the outcome. Um, and also, another thread within the literature review that indicated that preventative services prior to hospitalization also made the difference with the admission. So the strengths and weaknesses of our pilot, and I'll again go into the details of what we did. Um, despite advances in technology and um, increase in communication between funders and providers, there's still a disconnect. Even to this day, I've been struggling with it. I've been in UM for close to 12 to 13 years, and data and gaining information in a timely period has always been an issue. So we are only, our data is only as good as the information that we receive. Uh, so, in this instance, in this pilot, when we were notified of one of our members being hospitalized, we would manually input this into our electronic health record with NextGen, and then we track that for outcomes. However, um, at a later date, our funders would provide us with data that indicated, hey, there's this hospitalization you missed and this one you missed. So, not all hospitals are used to contacting us whenever one of our members gets admitted. So again, that's a weakness of, our, of, of ours that we've been struggling with, that we just don't have all the data in a timely manner. And then also, as I had mentioned before, the patient demographic varied. So uh, we had individuals that participated in this particular PDSA that had chronic health care conditions, um, who had a, also a diagnosis of serious mental illness, um, some were substance use disorder, so the, the, the demographic varied. The setting we used was, again, an integrated healthcare uh, outpatient setting. This is our what we call our Alvernon Clinic. It is uh, one of the largest in Pima County within Tucson. Uh, we serve approximately 3,000 duly diagnosed, diagnosed individuals at this particular setting. Um, in this setting, we have a pharmacy, we have primary care providers, we have psychiatrists, uh, we have social workers, we have therapists, we have peer support, so we run the gamut in terms of who's providing care in this services. Uh, we logistically, originally when we set out to do this PDSA, we set aside a room that we could use for this. Now, populations or participants identified in this particular study, um, as I'd mentioned before, were individuals that were hospitalized. So um, anybody discharged from a higher level of care, an emergency department, uh, a uh, detox setting uh, in 
Tucson, we have a crisis response center that acts as like a 24 um, seven sort of um, crisis setting where folks can be held for less than 24 hours or can be held in a subacute setting. Um, and those, into the, in those, we actually worked out a particular dialogue with the level ones and the hospitals in our county in order to let them know, hey, we're doing the study. So anybody that had gone through one of those settings was identified for our population. The only population that we did not include in this particular uh, study was our court ordered treatment uh, individuals because they had um, a separate set of rules when we originated this particular PDSA and uh, they had to see a specific type of provider. So we did not include them in this particular um, uh, PDSA in the beginning. Now, before I get into the details of the PDSA, um, as, as mentioned before, we we have done a, a large number of PDFA for the Plan Do Study Act, which I'll go into. Um, this is an alignment cycle through Six Sigma. Um, it's basically a model for improving um, frameworks, uh, testing and implementing change leading to improvement. So we had an idea, and this provided us the structure in order to implement that. Um, using the PDFA cycle uh, enables you to test out changes on a small scale. And it builds, um, you build on that and you learn from these test cycles. And as you will see throughout um, the discussion here today, you'll see that our PDSA evolved into several different PDSAs. It's for, it spearheaded uh, what we know to be a best practice currently. It also gives us, uh, this gives stakeholders the opportunity to see if proposed change will succeed. And it's a powerful tool for learning. So we learned a lot in the first implementation of this PDSA, second and third, and also from our other um, additional PDSAs that we, we developed after this. So again, the PDSA cycle, a lot of you are familiar with this. So uh, the plan, what are we gonna do? Um, when and how are we gonna do it? Uh, what changes are we going to, uh, what were the results and then how are we going to change on that? And many PDSAs result in a phase two and phase three. Uh, um, initiating this particular pilot, the phase one of our pilot, as I mentioned, our hypothesis was somebody going from an inpatient setting to an outpatient setting. When you decrease the, the period of time in between those, uh, the, when you decrease the, the time period for contact, post-discharge from hospitalization, that it will prevent uh, a readmission, an unnecessary readmission. So in our phase one, we essentially have the contact to the day of discharge, which uh, we'll get into the heat of measure, measure changes a little bit later. And then the phase two of this would be two days later. The contact post-discharge would be two days later. All right, so what is the, what is the procedure of our particular PDSA? So essentially what we had developed was a same day appointment, day of discharge. So this will be day zero, where a psychiatrist or a medical do doctor, depending on the nature of their hospitalization, would we would pick up an individual from a hospital and transport them directly to, to meet with this provider the same day. Now, how do we do this? Well, we um, locked off a period of time, a window time and in the afternoon, selected particular uh, providers or behavioral health medical providers, primary care providers that were able to help us in this particular PDSA and educate them on what we were trying to do. Most of them were, I mean, they were all in alignment with it and all felt like it was a good idea and were happy to participate in uh, our, our PDSA. Uh, during that clinic, a peer support staff pick up an individual um, from the hospital, transport them directly to the clinic um, with the discharge paperwork in hand. They met with the provider. We had a designated um, waiting area that had uh, peer support in that waiting room who were able to meet with that particular member, um, just talk to them about anything, any uh, hesitation that they had post-discharge, uh, how you doing? Uh, are there any services that, that you need that, you, that we might not have touched upon when you were in a very high level of care when things were a little stressful? During that time, they would meet uh, with the provider and then we had a, a large van. The peer support provider would take that member to the pharmacy within our clinic, fill their medications, make sure that they left the clinic with medications in hand, and then transport them home. 
uh, when they dropped them off at home, they would make sure that they uh, lived in a safe setting, uh, that they had food in their residence, that it, you know, it was a place that was basically supportive of that transition from a high level of care into uh, basically your community. You know, we're very uh, guilty of having folks you know, be hospitalized and then basically like jumping off a cliff out, going out into the community into a shelter where there's no support. So we try to at least smooth out that tr transition as much as possible. So I mentioned the blocks of time we had to, um, you know, de delegate specific time periods for those providers to meet with these particular individuals. And if we had a day because we can't uh, predict when folks discharge, it's all contingent on those inpatient providers. Um, if we had a day where we had extra or a few too many folks. Uh, discharge, we would have uh, somebody that was a backup to that provider catch anybody that, that we couldn't meet. Now, I, I'm mentioning this, I'm mentioning like we just picked the person up, but so much planning went into that, uh, like picking somebody up from a hospital. Now, we have you know, at least a dozen different hospitals in Pima County, and I'm being very conservative with that number, but we had to sit down with each of these providers and discuss a, a designated discharge pickup time. So that meant in our community, uh, our Palo Verde Healthcare Hospital, we had to pick them up at one o'clock. Sonora, we had to pick them up at 12 o'clock and we had to make sure that they in turn trained their providers that we ha they had to sign off on that discharge by that specific time. So it was a very, it was a very difficult uh, task, but we had a lot of planning in the beginning to make sure that that um, we were able to do that. And we found that most hospitals were willing to do that. They were like, oh, we have a designated time for pickup. We'll, we'll work on that. We'll in turn train our providers on that. Um, and they liked that they had the, they can rely on us for transportation. And so it definitely benefited all parties involved. And we, we mapped out a grid basically within the Tucson area on what makes sense to, for, for picking folks up. Now, I mentioned the, the day of discharge. So when we first initiated this pilot or this PDSA, um, they counted day zero. So that's day discharge. However, in 2018, as many of you know, they excluded the day of discharge as day zero. Now, how did that impact us? So because of that exclusion, uh, we decided to do um, a phase two. So I've mentioned before many Many PDSAs are just mini cycles, and so we wanted to learn from that and then go into the next evolved stage of, stage of that PDSA. So our phase two was essentially just, um, uh, we were still picking folks up, we were taking them home, however, we were also picking them up, but two days later from their home, from the community, and then transporting them to the discharge clinic. Now, in those instances, uh, it was it, it was not as successful as day zero because there's nothing like having that uh, person with you and that is a I guess for lack of a better word sacred time period where you don't necessarily get it back. So when somebody discharges to the community, um, you know they, there's many things that they have to do. There's family. There's this this reality. So when you have somebody in your presence, you're able to make a big impact. Um, directly that day, that day of discharge. You're also able to get the proper paperwork or discharge uh, paperwork that sometimes gets missing or sometimes the provider will not send us in time. So we just had uh, a lot, it was a lot smoother to transition somebody from an inpatient to an outpatient that day of discharge. However, because of the huge changes, we had to change it to two days out. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nicole, who's going to talk to you a little bit about um, what happened? Uh, what were the results? What was the data? Hey, hi everyone. My name is Nicole Huggett. I'm the Director of Population Health for Kodak. Um, and my background is in social work and now I do all the fun data stuff. Um, so yeah, I'll be going over our analysis and results for this pilot, um, looking a little bit at phase one and phase two. So first I'm just going to start with um, talking about the variables that we looked at in order to um, test the success of this pilot. So obviously we're interested in HEDIS measures, so we looked at that 7 and 30 day follow up after hospitalization. Um, and to analyze that data we used run charts, which is a really common um, 
an analytic tool used in healthcare improvement, and I will definitely be going over that just in case you're not familiar. Um, we, of course, looked at readmissions because the 7 and 30 day follow-up is really meant to prevent those readmissions. And um, so a readmission, just as a reminder, is an admission that occurs 30 days, um, within 30 days of just discharge from a prior hospitalization. Um, and for that, we used a straightforward rate calculation with ANCOVA analysis to test for significance. And because, of course, a lot of this is related to cost factors. We also looked at costs, um, both hospitalization costs and charge costs. And those were estimates, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So, um, okay, there we go. Our study was structured as a quasi-experimental research design. So what that means is that we did not have random assignment. We used the convenient sample, um, largely because it was very convenient. And, you know, in this kind of work, you just kind of have to roll with it sometimes. And so that's what worked for us. So we had people who went through the pilot, and then our comparison group consisted of people who were not able to go through the pilot, but who um, were hospitalized during the same time frame. And so, some of the limitations of that are just that our results from the study are not generalizable to uh, the wider public, but we can draw conclusions about the people that we serve, specifically the people that participated in this pilot. Um, there were a couple of other limitations that we had to deal with. One of those was that we don't always get comprehensive hospitalization data, and so that affects us in ways like, for example, um, we're only following up on hospitalizations that we know about. And so some of the numbers that we have are our best estimates based on the information that we know. We had to exclude all ED data just because we, at the time of this pilot, weren't getting very comprehensive ED data. Um, we only, for claims um, data, had access to our internal claims. And so when we talk about costs, uh, it's only internal costs, and then we, when we look at hospitalization costs, we had to use um, an estimate daily rate that we had from the system, only because, again, that's not something that the, um, either the health plans or the facilities can actually provide with us. And then as we go through the information, I'll be talking about our pilot group who actually received the intervention, our comparison group who did not, and then the index hospitalization is the hospitalization um, at which time our pilot group received the intervention or our comparison group did not, but it's the hospitalization that occurred uh, during the time frame to include them in the study. So for this, all of our data was collected in NextGen. We have a customized template where we collect our hospitalization data. We received that from various sources. Um, a lot of it is because we have those relationships built with the hospitals and we have people on site that let us know uh, when someone has been hospitalized. We're now getting more comprehensive data from our state HIE and that's been really helpful. And then we have a set staff person who actually enters all of the data herself. We do this in order to keep it very um, consistent and accurate. She is the only one who's allowed to enter it unless she's on PCO, then I do it myself, just so that we know that um, this information is being entered accurately. In addition to that, we also looked at services we provided, which of course was just queried out of NextGen from our database. Okay, so before we um, actually start an analysis, of course, we needed to make sure that it would be okay to compare these two groups. So I did a baseline analysis just to see how our groups were the same and different. So in our pilot group, we had 103 people, and our comparison group had 142 people. They were really similar um, in terms of demographics, so age, gender, race, ethnicity, and then also housing status. We had roughly the same number of homeless versus non-homeless people, um, healthcare costs, prior to the intervention, and then diagnoses. They were a little bit different in terms of utilization prior to the intervention timeframe. Um, so our pilot group had slightly higher utilization in the 30 days before they um, went through the intervention compared to our comparison group had slightly lower in those 30 days prior to that index hospitalization. Um, so what that means is that I just ended up using that in our analysis as a covariate that might be a confounding variable. So I controlled for that so that I can make sure that these were okay to compare. So 
So outcomes, how many people actually readmitted after the initial hospitalization? We had 20% um, or 21 people in our pilot group who did end up readmitting compared to 38 people in our comparison group, which was 27%. So looking at that in a little bit more detail, changes in hospital utilization. Here we're looking at our comparison group. So these are the people who did not go through the intervention. They started out with an average of 0.14 hospitalizations in the 30 days prior to that index hospitalization. So what that means is that some people had no hospitalizations and some people had multiple, but it averaged out to less than one per person. Um, and afterward, there was still less than one per person, but it was a little bit higher. So with this group, we saw um, an increased length of stay after that index hospitalization, which accounted for that higher, um, that higher number. And then when we take a look at our pilot group, as I mentioned, they started with a little bit higher uh, utilization and then decreased from 0.42 to 0.33. So just to put that in perspective, so you can see how those changes occurred. Um, and just because they were, they were so different here, as I mentioned, that was something I ended up controlling for. So I did that by um, calculating a change variable, basically. So I looked at each person and looked at utilization before and after the index hospitalization um, and did that for everyone in both groups. And with that change variable, sorry for the overlap a little bit on that text, but you can see that our comparison group had a mean increase of 0.27 hospitalizations per person, where, while our pilot group had that mean decrease of 0.09 hospitalizations. And we got a p-value of 0 0.000, so very statistically significant. Um, we were really happy with that, the results of that univariate analysis. So moving on to cost savings then, what does that look like? Um, of course, these really just reflect the hospital admissions for both groups. Because we had a 51% decrease for our pilot group, their costs went down um, from $1,600 roughly per person before, and then afterward we were looking at $800 per person averaged out. Um, compared to the comparison group who started around $850 and went up to $1,400 per person. Um, but putting that in really practical terms, our cost savings, sorry, that slide should look a little bit different. Um, basically, we saw that our total before were $168,000 uh, total, and then there is normally a bar right here that shows us that we had a cost savings of $190,000. So if our pilot group had actually continued admitting and readmitting at the same rate that we saw that our, that we observed in our comparison group, then our total cost would have actually been um, closer to $250,000. And really we observed uh, only um, $82,000. And so we saved $63,000 a month during the, through the duration of the pilot. And that was a total cost savings of $190,000. Um, so, we're here for the heat of stuff though, right? How did we do? Um, we actually did not quite meet our target on our heat of measures. So, it was kind of a, a difficult thing when we looked at the data and we were like, okay, we're not quite meeting our measures, but we're clearly having a statistically significant impact on our members. Um, and that ended up being pretty also heavily affected by the measure change. So let's take a look at that. Um, we're looking here at only our seven-day follow-up rates for our um, initial phase pilots. And as I promised before, if you're not familiar with these, I'll go through this because I know it's a lot of data on one screen. Um, so at the time of these interventions, our goal for this measure was 85%, and that was set by um, the major payer in our region. Before we started the intervention, our median here was 38%. And with a run chart, what we do is look at the, our performance and how it moves around the median. So if we have a bunch of points above median, below median, um, trending up or down, or even just too much or not enough movement around the median, we know that something statistically significant is happening that we need to pay attention to. And if we can attribute it to an intervention that we've provided, even better, of course. Um, so what you can see here is we started our 
phase one, it was around uh, late May of 2017. And before that, as I mentioned, we had a 38% median, uh, which was slightly higher than Southern Arizona agencies at the time at 32%. And historically, Arizona rates have not been quite at 85%. So that was definitely a reach goal. Um, so we actually increased our median to 50% after we implemented the intervention. You can see that if this line had carried over, we would have had almost all of our data above the median, which told us that was statistically significant improvement. In January, when that measure change took effect, it really hit us hard. Our rates started falling because we, um, even when we changed our intervention to be actually transporting people two days out after their hospitalization, it was just so hard to get them back in the office. Once, you know, once they're gone, it can be really difficult to get people who, um, you know, don't have up-to-date contact information or don't have stable housing, even if they're not homeless, uh, you can't always find them in the same place, or they have difficulty with transportation. And so that hit us hard. Um, but then I think that we also did a lot of talking as an agency about um, kind of weighing some of the costs and benefits of this intervention. So we know that we're saving the system money and we're providing better outcomes for our members because they're not going back into the hospital. So that tells us that their health is um, in a good place. And so at that point in time, we actually decided to stay with day zero appointments because we knew that that was better for our members, even though we were not meeting the HEDIS measure. Um, and I do have just one more slide of data because I wanted to show you something a little bit more up to date. And we have a new phase in this pilot that Amy's going to talk about. Um, so our new goal from the health plan is 60% at this point in time for this fiscal year. Um, and we started a new pilot because we decided, okay, we need to figure out a way to get those good outcomes for our members and meet our HEDIS measures because um, these value-based contracts are, of course, very important. And so we started a new phase of the pilot in July of this year. And so far, um, we've had some ups and downs in performance. Uh, we're tracking this at a weekly basis now just because we're still so new into the data. And of course, at the time of this presentation, I. Um, only had through the beginning of August. But so far at that point, we had four out of the six weeks we had met or exceeded our goal of 60% for seven day follow up. Um, so it's looking really promising. And it's just something I wanted to share this because I wanted to say that this is really an ongoing process. I think that this is kind of one of the more complicated measures that there are just so many moving pieces. And especially we have new measure changes coming up. Uh, for the upcoming fiscal year that changes place of service, um, opens that up a little bit actually. And so we're just, you know, we continue tracking it. This PDSA phase, it just keeps going. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of, of that method of performance improvement. So um, I'm gonna pass this back over to Amy so that she can finish up. Thank you. Great, thanks, Nicole. So as we mentioned, um, PDSA, it, it works well when you're establishing new processes, especially for some of these value-based thresholds that we are being held to. Um, what we did was apply learning on a smaller scale and then gradually scale up in volume. So as, as mentioned, we went from phase one to phase two, and now we spearheaded an additional PDSA that Nicole had mentioned, which is our one to seven day follow-up. So this additional product project essentially is an additional layer of care post-hospitalization. So when somebody is discharged from a higher level of care, we have an appropriate provider, so an independently licensed provider who is uh, following up with that individual uh, within one to seven days post-discharge. So the way that plays out is our dedicated discharge team um, basically sets up an appointment. Now, in the times of COVID currently, we're doing that virtually, so we are doing a telephonic appointment with that independently licensed provider um, with, from the time period of one to seven days. We work it out, we orient that, that we orient the, the person served to the project, we say, hey, uh, we just want to touch base with you after you're discharged and make sure that everything went smoothly, if there's anything that you need to discuss. This is an extra uh, benefit or extra support to you after that that um, 
that period of time where you're going from, you know, again, a higher level of care to outpatient setting. And currently we're meeting um, every couple of weeks or every month uh, uh, with those providers and our discharge uh, planning or discharge team to see what's working, what's not working. But we have seen some promising uh, outcomes in this uh, in, in the infancy, in this early stages of this particular PDSA. We had another PDSA which focused on um, diagnoses, clinical diagnoses of the individuals that were admitting and readmitting frequently. Um, that, that particular PDSA did not work out as, as, as well as some of these more practical PDSAs, but we, just to kind of summarize that, that particular PDSA, is we looked at the profile of individuals that were admitting and readmitting. Uh, identified their their common diagnoses and then developed curriculum or therapeutic curriculum to tailor uh, to that particular population in order to prevent readmission and meet their needs on in a less restrictive level of care. Um, but, but again, that one took a lot more planning. It also required a, an additional layer of participation from the person served, um, which which didn't actually pan out. But the one to seven day follow up project has proved to be very um, successful in its infancy. So. All right, so that concludes our presentation. If you'd like more information on our discharge, uh, our discharge PDSA, I have put a link to the video which kind of defines uh, steps and works it out on a more practical level. Um, if you're like me, I need to see things visually. So it's a visual uh, YouTube video on that that you can watch um, on your own time. I'm going to go ahead and open it up for any questions you might have. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Amy. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have a question, please use the Q&A panel in the bottom right hand of your screen to type them in. Um, and we did get a few questions during the presentation, so I will start with them. This question is for Ronke. Which population health system would you suggest providers use to advance their population health program? Um, there are several population health systems out there. Um, to pick the right population health system, you have to look at your programs, the type of contracts you have, and the quality metrics you're trying to achieve. Um, obviously, trying to pick a system, um, it would be significantly helpful um, and provide a better um, result if you choose a system that has both descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytic tools. That way you can use, look at the current state of your quality metrics and the patient. You can use that to predict the future, and then you can identify the gaps and be able to provide a prescriptive standard of care to resolve, resolve those gaps in care. Of course, NextGen has a great tool, but again, there are several tools out there. Just make sure they have those three core um, elements. The next question is for Nicole. Can we use non hedis measures to capture outcome measures for our population health program? Definitely. I think that HEDIS measures are, I actually don't think of them very often as outcome measures. I think they're much more process focused. Um, so we do a number of, uh, we measure outcomes in a number of different ways. I do think that hospitalizations is a really great um, indicator because, so sorry, dog's barking. Um, it tells us how our people are doing, you know, if they're not healthy enough to stay in the community, uh, clearly that's a major indication. Uh, but we also do a lot of assessments in the office uh, self reported outcomes, I think are really important to get that perception um, of you know, how members feel that they're functioning. And so I actually think that you should definitely use a number of different tools outside of HEDIS measures for that. The next question is for Amy. Do you have to help decrease ED utilization by behavioral health members with comorbid conditions? And the question was, do we have to have that? Do you have to help decrease ED utilization? Oh, do we have to help decrease that? Um, Yes, we, I mean, it, somebody that's presenting in the ED is obviously in crisis and our overarching theme to all of these different PDSAs is to make sure that that individual is not in crisis, um, that decreased costs, that increases like um, their, you know, basically their quality of life. Um, so overall, 
you know, we, this particular uh, PDSA, though we just focus on ED visits for this, um, it's it, as a, like an, an kind of secondary outcome prevented those ED, those unnecessary ED visits just by the ad added layer of care. Um, in my experience, folks uh, will go to the ED if they get discharged from a hospital and there's a snafu with the pharmacy, um, no prior authorization for a medication that they might have lost prior to that, or some minor occurrence that can be prevented by, by a discharge clinic. The next question, I believe, is for Nicole, and it's how was the control group selected? So for the control group, we looked at people who admitted to the hospital during the same time frame that we were running the pilot, but who, uh, for whatever reason, didn't end up going through the intervention. Uh, we excluded all COT people just because, as Amy mentioned, it's kind of a group with different needs. Um, but there were people that either refused or that we just couldn't catch in time or didn't know about. Some of those individuals had natural supports that were um, you know, that wanted to pick them up and take them home the same day, and we wanted to honor that. The next question is, did you use internal claims data to measure compliance with HEDIS? Um, so we did, and that was, you know, one of the limitations is that we really only had access to what services were providing. And so we don't know if people might have actually gotten services that qualified for this measure at other places in the community. That's totally a possibility. Um, granted, in my in my experience, looking at this data a lot, I can say that um, we don't actually see that happen a whole lot. Usually the services that meet this measure do come from us. I think we have time for one more. This question is for Ronke. Is there a particular value-based payment program that seems better for integrated care programs? Um, there's no particular value-based contract is, is better than another. It just depends on the program and the agency and the payer model. So, of course, the payers based on the contracts they have either with Medicare or Medicaid have to develop some form of value-based contract. Whatever value-based contracts are developed and outcome measures and quality measures included will be passed down to the providers. So, again, it's based on the type of services the providers offer. So, it's truly a negotiation between the payer and the provider on what type of value-based contract to have. The, um, all the value-based contracts have one thing in common, and that's to decrease costs and improve quality of care and patient outcomes. Excellent. This concludes our presentation. I'd like to thank our speakers for presenting today, as well as all of our attendees for devoting an hour to us for continued learning. For more information, please visit our website, nextgen.com forward slash Thank you and have a great day.